Welcome to this year's athletic department meeting for the 24-25 school year. My name is Joe Schneider. I'm the Associate Principal Activities Director here at Monona Grove High School, entering my fourth year at Monona Grove High School. I've been uh, very fortunate to be with this community as it's a very supportive community. It's been awesome um, and really excited to enter into this fourth year with our programs and want to get us started on a consistent foot here as we move forward into this school year and into our sports seasons. A little bit about me and why I do what I do, why I'm entering my fourth year as an APAD here, is I serve to bring people together to inspire discipline and integrity for the improvement of society as a whole. I believe our athletic programs are the way to improve society as a whole. There's a lot of value on sports and athletics, a lot of value on activities here, and we can really utilize and leverage those in order to give our students a full educational experience, hopefully tying in discipline and integrity into their daily life choices and, and beyond, essentially into anything that they wanna do from here. A little bit of an overview as far as what to expect throughout this particular meeting. We'll talk about values and cultures. We'll hit on some WIA rules. We'll talk about getting connected with our programs. We'll take a section to uh, see our athletic trainer to talk about the athletic training aspect of our programs. We'll also overview the code expectations as well as anything in regards to athletic registration to make sure that you're all set there. Hopefully throughout this athletic department meeting, you'll see that we're being concise, relevant, and efficient throughout the entire thing, allowing you to, it also allows you to provide a connection for all programs, so that all of them have this consistency in messaging, which is why we're doing this unified messaging this way. Uh, what we also want to do throughout this meeting is be able to get to a point of where you can finish your athletic registration so that that is all set and done. And also to check in or get any questions or clarification that you may need, there's a QR code that you'll see in the lower right hand corner of your screen here, the lower right hand corner of the slide that you can scan that allows you to check in to say that you have uh, viewed this video, viewed this presentation, um, as well as an opportunity for you to ask for, to provide us any feedback, as well as look for opportunities for clarification. And we'll look to get that clarification in the most efficient means possible as we continue to look to improve and provide clarifying information to our community. Hi, I'm Lily and I play volleyball here at MG. I'm here to share student expectations for our programs that were developed by student athlete leaders in the last few years. The purpose of our athletic programs is to create a sense of community, foster unity, and bring people together. We believe that sports are more than just games. They're a platform for building lasting connections and promoting a supportive environment. As student athletes, we have the following three core values. Accountability. We hold ourselves and each other responsible for our actions and our commitments. Teamwork. We work together, supporting and uplifting one another to achieve common goals. Respect. We treat everyone with dignity and honor, both on and off the field. We strive to instill the following traits among our peers. Pride. We take pride in our efforts, our school, and our community. Competitive. We embrace healthy competition, always aiming to do our best. Respectful. We show respect to our peers, coaches, opponents, and everyone we encounter. At Monona Grove, we have program talents which tie into our three student athlete core values, traits and purpose, which focus on developing key attributes in our students. Commitment, dedication to our goals and responsibilities. Spirit, enthusiasm and passion for what we do. Community, a strong sense of belonging and contributing to something greater. Leadership, guiding and inspiring others to achieve their best. Within our athletic programs, we look for the following qualities to build upon. Leadership and mentorship. We provide opportunities for our students to lead and mentor others, building essential skills for their future. Culture. We create a positive and inclusive culture where everyone feels valued and motivated. Relationships. Building strong, supportive relationships with peers, coaches, and the community. Training and development. We focus on the holistic development of our student athletes, providing them with the tools and training they need to excel. Our goal is to win. But our purpose is to create better people through our programs. We believe that the experiences and lessons learned here will help our students grow into well-rounded individuals who are prepared for success in all aspects of life.
We're gonna take a moment now to talk about amateur status as well as NIL rules, which are coming up a lot more frequently, uh, especially this past year and is coming up more frequently in the state of Wisconsin. If you search articles in the state of Wisconsin for NIL and amateur status, you'll see that this is a huge talking point amongst our state right now, but here is where we currently stand as far as our rules. A student athlete must maintain amateur status for eligibility with our programs. And in general, in order to lose amateur status, those violations are gonna include you're receiving money for, your, for athletics, you are signing contracts in some way, shape, or form for that athletic achievement or athletics related, you're benefiting from endorsements, or you're appearing in advertisement or promotional materials as an athlete. So for the most part, really anytime you're being signed a contract to, to promote yourself or to promote something else, that's going to end up being an amateur status violation. My general rule there is if you're looking at participating in anything like this, reach out to our athletic office so we can kind of help you out with that. Uh, but also really right now for the state of Wisconsin, there's not a lot of opportunity or wiggle room as far as someone receiving any money or benefit from their NIL. We're just not currently at that state for the, or not currently in that world for the WIA. Um, it is something that's continuing to be talked about and you can't promote, uh, find, you can't appear in advertisements or promoting programs, especially those athletic related programs. You also cannot receive free or reduced rates for equipment, camps, or clinics. And if there is a re free or reduced rate, it's gotta be available to all participants. It's gotta be equal amongst everyone. Uh, but those things essentially student athletes and families need to pay their own way in order to accomplish a lot of programs and that includes in school and out of school. If you have any questions, by all means, reach out and usually reach out when these situations tend to arise. We can help navigate them um, a little bit more clearly. And another thing just to keep in mind is that if you play or um, compete under a false name, that's going to automatically make a student athlete ineligible as well. Uh, ultimately, your, your eligibility, your name, image, likeness, and your amateur status, that's yours to manage as an athlete uh, and yours to manage as a family, and that's something that you just got to make sure you're being aware of. This is getting a little bit murkier now all across the United States. More states are opening up NIL and amateur status opportunities for their high school student athletes. So just because something might look okay in another state doesn't mean it's okay in our state right now. We're still uh, pretty restrictive when it comes to those statuses or when it comes to those types of violations. Like I said, reach out to our athletic office. We can help you navigate that if it comes up. Something else with amateur status and NIL rules is those penalties can be reduced as long as we have proper documentation and we are uh, we have a resolution to the situation or restitution of some kind. So we can kind of work our way back on that and be able to reduce any potential penalties. And like I said, your NIL is yours. You got to own it and management, manage it. And you also got to know the consequences of it uh, when your name image likeness is out there. Something else that you can know as parents, uh, some of you may have been on the receiving end of this as as business owners is I send out a letter to our cha local chamber of commerces every year, every summer, just asking them to refrain from using our student athletes and helping educate them a little bit more about the amateur status rules that currently exist for the WIA in order to try to curb that as well. For the most part, nobody wants to commit these violations. So they do end up happening just simply not knowing any better of the rule. So we wanna to work to avoid them and that's really what we wanna emphasize is prevention on those. Hi, I'm Eliza Martin and I'm involved in girls tennis. I'd like to take a moment to share some important resources and ways you can stay updated with Monona Grove Athletics. MononaGroveAthletics.com is our main website where you can find weekly posts, schedules, and individual team sites as our coaches update them. The site is primarily informational and is a great resource to keep you in the loop. BadgerConference.org for official scheduling, visit badgerconference.org. You can get real-time alerts and updates on all our athletic events. It's the go-to place for accurate scheduling information. Social media? Follow us on social media for the latest updates and highlights. Instagram at Monona Grove Athletics, X or formerly Twitter is at MGHS Sports, and Facebook is Monona Grove Athletics. MG Activities Athletics Minute? Tune in to our MG Activities slash Athletics Minute podcast for weekly interviews. We feature members of our activities and athletics community, offering insights and stories that you won't want to miss. Thank you for staying connected and supporting Monona Grove Athletics. Hello, Monona Grove High School athletes and families. 
My name is Jackie Landry, and I am the athletic trainer here at MG. I work for UW Health, who has a contract with Monona Grove High School for daily training room hours and athletic event coverage during the WIAA sports seasons. In general, the training room is open Monday through Friday after school until about 6.30 p.m. throughout the school year. Any student athlete can come to me for injury care and evaluation, rehabilitation programs and pre-practice or pre-game needs like taping and wrapping. I can also help with referring student athletes to UW Health sports medicine physicians and physical therapists when it is needed. I am looking forward to another year of athletics and will work hard every day to ensure the safety of all student athletes. In order to do this to the best of my ability, I need some help from you as athletes, parents, and guardians. Please pay attention to the following requests. Promptly report injuries to coaches and or myself. It is crucial that athletes, parents, guardians, and myself are all on the same page. Provide coaches or myself with doctor's notes when activities should be restricted or when full clearance is given after an injury or illness. Report concussion symptoms immediately and remove yourself from play. And lastly, please familiarize yourself with the Monona Grove High School concussion care guidelines and the return to play protocol outlined in the Athletics and Activities Code. Here is my contact information. Don't hesitate to reach out with any questions or concerns. Hi, I'm Lucy. I'm a captain for the girls swim team. I wanted to go over some important guidelines for our student athletes regarding their participation in non-school and school competitions. Loyalty to the school team. During the sports season, athletes must prioritize their loyalty to their school team. This means your commitment to your school team comes first. Non-school competitions. Athletes are allowed to participate in up to two non-school competitions per season in the same sport in which they are participating for the school. However, these must be approved by the school beforehand. Remember, participation in non-school competitions is prohibited during the WIAA tournament series. Exceeding the limit. If an athlete participates in more than two non-school competitions without prior approval, they will become ineligible for the remainder of the season. We want to ensure everyone understands these rules to maintain fairness and integrity within our teams. Thank you for your attention and cooperation. Let's now talk about really our code components and we're going to start off by talking about the academic expectations in order to participate in our programs. Ultimately, the overarching rule in our code book is that participants in activities shall not receive any failing grades at the end of any quarter. When considering academic eligibility, only grades reflecting academic performance during the most recent grading period will be considered. So when looking at that, what does that mean? Ultimately, any student who has a failing grade is going to have their eligibility interrupted. So as soon as you have that one failing grade and we have dates established in our code book as far as when those are in effect because we do have some time in order to process, in order to make sure teachers get their grades up to date and any, re any potential resolutions can be resolved or any potential situations can be resolved, you get 21 calendar days of ineligibility from the date in which it is posted. If you have two or more failing grades, that means you're not going to have eligibility for the entire quarter. You are free to practice during this time but you will not be eligible for competition. So essentially to be able to represent Monona Grove beyond our own community is going to be restricted. The way you can get that back earlier as a student with two or more failing grades, with multiple failing grades, is if you can demonstrate that ad progress report, you have, you have shown that you have all C's or better, you will immediately regain your eligibility at that progress report. A C minus would not cut it. That cutoff has to be somewhere and we go C or higher. To see those specific dates of how long they are going to be, they're outlined in Appendix C of our activities and athletics code so that you can see that depending on your sport or activity exactly what you are involved in. Keep in mind, when it comes to eligibility, grades are a snapshot. Once it's posted, that's the record. It is not all of a sudden that immediate moment of it's posted, oh, now I need to fix it, or now I'm going to turn in a bunch of work. This is something that as student athletes, you need to be ahead of. You have to make sure that you are taking care of what you need to take care of ahead of time, and deadlines do matter. You know that deadline is coming up. Teachers are communicative, and there are things posted everywhere. It's outlined in our code. 
this needs to be done by a certain time and you also need to be realistic with what your expectations are of when your teachers are getting it done. Our teachers are great and will work with you uh, with those situations leading up, but ultimately deadlines are real. So make sure you're communicative and you're on top of it. Keep in mind there's grading time built in to everything within those deadlines. And also as a student athlete and as families, just so that you're aware of the systems of support that exist within our grading practices, we have equal interval grading for attemptive summatives. So essentially that means is that gr those grades are on a scale of 50 to 100. So as long as an honest effort is, tur is turned in for work or there is evidence there of uh, some sort of knowledge on that particular assignment, the grade is no lower than a 50. So we have that equal interval grading on items that are turned in. We allow retakes and revisions. We have those policies outlined in our student handbook. We have late work acceptance policies that are there as well. We have classroom teachers, core area resource centers. We have academic resource centers. We have overtime and we also have a testing center for students to make things up. The message that I am communicating is there are a lot of systems of support that exist for our student athletes and for students in general in order to obtain the grade that they, uh, that they desire. A lot of things are there in order to get help and support take advantage of those. Those are the things we need to be taking advantage of in order to make sure that our grades are where they need to be. You are a student athlete, the student has to come first. And just as it states here, education-based athletics, that's our purpose. The education must come first. You gotta pass all of your classes and eligibility will not be interrupted by grades. One of the bigger areas of our activities in athletics code is attendance. We expect students to go to school. Okay? When in doubt, go to school. And in order to participate in our after-school extracurricular activities or our after-school activities, you've got to be in school the whole day. And the only way that you can get exceptions to this is if you have a prearranged absence, such as a doctor or medical reason. You need to get a note to our attendance office, and for best practice, you should get it in by noon of that day. That can be appointment confirmations, and it can be simple notes from our from the provider letting them know that yes, there is evidence of a, a medical type excuse or a medical appointment that we have here. Essentially, that needs to be on file to still remain eligible after school in those cases. A parent excuse is not enough to maintain eligibility. And the truth is, is ultimately we wanna take that decision out of your hands. If a kid wakes up tired, too tired to go to school at the start of the morning, then you know what? They're too tired to participate after school as well. We have to give a full commitment to school before we do that. We do have some extenuating circumstances uh, in which we allow pre approved for athletic participation. You reach out to our athletic office and see that situation. The most common ones that we deal with are things such as funerals. Uh, unexcused absence on a Friday. So if you have, if on a Friday, you have an unexcused absence during that day that's going to render a student athlete ineligible for the entire weekend. So ultimately, like I said, when in doubt, go to school. Uh, otherwise, you need a doctor's note on file that uh, would allow you to still participate after school if you have a doctor's appointment or a medical appointment of some kind. That gets handled through our attendance office. If at any time you are found to be finding fault or providing false or misleading information as it is, as it revolves around your attendance so that you can maintain athletic or activities participation, you're going to be subject to an eligibility period as soon as school personnel are made aware of it. Uh, and it's going to be no less than one week of eligibility for practice and competition at that point. It's all going to be devi it's also going to be determined based on how egregious that particular penalty was. As far as the actual process of how this works, coaches are going to get a report at 3 p.m. each day that's going to be sent to them essentially with an exclusion list. So essentially if student athletes one of, if one of their student athletes is on that list, they are not able to participate in after school activities. So if you got that medical note in and attendance is all good, then they don't ever know that a student was actually gone. You have tools to monitor attendance via Infinite Campus. That's yours to own it. Issues are best addressed with the, the teacher or the attendance office if they were to arise. If you got an absence in whoever's class, your best bet is to go to that teacher as soon as you are made aware that you were received an absence and you believe it is incorrect, or to reach out to our attendance office as soon as that. There are tools on Infinite Campus. You can get an app on your phone that will immediately send notifications as soon as a student is marked absent. Both student and parent guardian can get those notifications. You can sign up for that. If there are any patterns of tardiness or lateness to class, you could be ineligible for the next contest or activity, and that pattern is determined by associate principals working with you on attendance. Go to school. 
And like I said, full commitment to school is necessary before you can really delve into that after school commitment. If you are not well enough to start the day, you're not well enough to participate at the end of the day. Uh, there's a lot of rationale behind that in order to make sure student athletes are protected and also to make sure that we are given that full commitment to school to prevent any academic ineligibility issues. There are also conduct expectations. So anytime you're looking at a high school athletic and activities code, there's really three pillars to it to stay eligible. Attendance, attendance, academics, as well as conduct. And here is that third pillar. We have sore expectations within our building and ultimately if you're following those expectations, you're gonna be in good shape. You're scholarly, organized, accountable, and responsible. Scholarly, you're getting your schoolwork done, you're studying, you're working hard, and you care about your, your academics. You're organized, you're on time, punctual, and fully present for your classes. You're accountable, you're, on it, you're honest, and you understand the consequences of your actions, and you're also responsible, avoiding prohibited behavior, and essentially doing what you should be doing. We have five conduct violations in our activities and athletics code. The first one is AODA violations. The second is state and federal statutes that essentially fall into the I the criminal acts section. We also have municipal ordinance violations, conduct unbecoming, and school suspensions. Here's how these, there are more words listed in the code that you can take a look at, but essentially when it comes to AODA violations, our student athletes shall not use, possess, or be an accessory to supplying any AODA, any alcohol or other drugs or anything that they should not have in their possession. Uh, state and federal statutes as well as municipal, the language there is they shall not commit, allegedly commit, or receive a citation for any violation of state and federal statutes as well as municipal ordinance violations. Conduct unbecoming covers that they shall not violate the school handbook, participate in negative or unsportsmanlike conduct at school events or online. The conduct penalties are as follows. When it comes to violations one and two, those are cumulative. So essentially, you get started put into a track and it, it expands upon each violation from there. With violations one and two, those are all grouped together. So your first violation in that ends up in a 25% suspension of whatever your sports season is, 50% for the second violation, ineligible for an entire calendar year and then two calendar years after that. For violations three and four, we do no less than the next upcoming competition and event, and usually we put together some sort of plan of improvement or behavior plan or what we can do moving forward on those. And then violation five just dictates that if you are suspended for school, you're expended through all extracurricular activities as well through the last day of suspension of 11.59 p.m. The other thing to make you aware of for participants in WIAA extracurricular activities or WIAA interscholastic athletics is the WIAA felony rule, which states a student charged and or convicted of a felony shall upon the filing of felony charges become ineligible for all further participation until the student has paid his or her debt to society and the courts consider the sentence served. That includes probation, community service, etc. So essentially any student that ends up with a felony charge of any kind at that particular moment is now ineligible for our WIA programs and really ineligible for our activities as well. That whole process needs to be done and over with, including whatever the sentence that was served prior to being reinstated. Remember, participation in our programs is a privilege, not a right. These are situations that we need to avoid. So this and when it comes to our conduct portion of it, this is a reason to avoid anything that could be considered a close call. You can't be near it. Because even if you get wrapped up into it and you don't feel like you deserve getting the blame or whatever it may be, you can't be there. You, can't, you, you have to avoid those situations and we wanna make sure our code is a reason for you to say no. And keep in mind that as soon as a citation or charges are issued, that penalty is enforced. So you, like I said, it can't be close. This is the incentive to say no to potential peer, peer pressure, and it is a privilege to participate, not a right of participation. When it comes to representing MG beyond our community, it is a huge responsibility, and you have to be up to the task 24-7. It is an all-the-time commitment. When it comes to our conduct rules, our state association requires year-round enforcement of that. So if you had something that happened a couple months before the season started and now it just came on our radar, doesn't matter, we still have to enforce that year round. 
Also for WIA Athletics, there, any portion that you miss of the WIA tournament, you're suspended or ineligible for the entire tournament. So for instance, we'll use football because that has a five game playoff. If you end up with a violation that would take you out of level one football or that first round playoff game, you would be ineligible through state. There's no coming back. Once you have violated a conduct portion of a school's athletic code and it eliminates you from any portion of the WIA tournament, you are done for the rest of the tournament. There is no exceptions to that rule. When you end up in these situations, we also, <laughs> when or if, and hopefully you don't end up in these situations, but ultimately if it does happen, we do have a self-referral reduction. And essentially that self-referral reduction is that you approach administration or a, one of your coaches to admit to the infraction the next school day or practice day, so essentially any contact day after the infraction. And we'll reduce it based on our reduction calendar. So 25% would go down to 10% of a season, 50 down to 25 is how we work that. We also offer students the ability to go through the student assistance program, which essentially helps students try to avoid these behaviors in the future. And this allows some cumulative status reduction, and you could also get some award recognition eligibility back that you would not otherwise have if you are serving a violation, depending on how all that works. You can reference the code for any more details, uh, and those situations can be specified based on how they come up as well. Hi, I'm Mackenzie Babcock, and I'm involved in cross country and track. I'd like to share with you the Silver Eagle Support 6, our guidelines for supporting Monona Grove Athletics in the best way possible. Be there. Attending athletic events demonstrates your commitment, fosters community, and creates a positive atmosphere for both players and fans. Your presence matters. MG Focus. We're Monona Grove, and that's where our focus should be. The MG Focus is all about keeping chance positive, emphasizing Monona Grove, enhancing team spirit, and maintaining a respectful environment. Chance targeting opposing players, teams, or officials are not accepted. No BCDs. Blaming, complaining, defending. Avoiding blame, complaints, and defensiveness promotes accountability, positive problem solving, and a constructive sports environment. Let's focus on solutions and positivity. Honor officials and opponents. Respecting officials and opponents builds a culture of fairness and integrity. This contributes to a positive image for our team and sports community. Speak up in the moment. We encourage individuals to address issues promptly, fostering open communication, accountability, and a healthy sports environment. Don't hesitate to speak up if something needs to be addressed. Make us proud. Upholding positive behavior reflects well on our team and community. By demonstrating good sportsmanship and respect, we foster pride and unity within Monona Grove. Help us with the mission. We need your support in all aspects, including as spectators, to help us grow as student athletes to achieve our goals. This includes the next play mentality. We need everyone to adopt the next play mentality. This means focusing on what's next rather than fixating on a call or a mistake. Dwelling on what's already happened doesn't help anyone. Instead, let's concentrate on the next play and how we can improve. Student athlete mentality, creating a positive and supportive environment is crucial for the mental health of our student athletes. We all have a role in this by promoting positivity and support. Conflict resolution and managing emotions. Athletic programs are an opportunity to grow. It's important to handle conflicts constructively and manage our emotions effectively. This means staying calm, communicating openly, and resolving issues in a way that builds understanding and cooperation. By focusing on these points, we can help our athletes stay mentally strong, foster a positive environment, and ensure that we're always moving forward together. Thank you for your commitment to supporting our athletes and creating a positive environment for everyone involved. There is also a consequence progression that happens if someone were to be removed or ejected from an interscholastic athletic competition for flagrant harassment or unsportsmanlike conduct. They would be suspended for from attendance for no less than a competitive event, but not less than one complete game or meet. And that is in WIA game management bylaws. And within the first instance, there is a notation that a spectator is to miss the next contest per WIA game management bylaw language. If it's a second instance, then it's going to be no less than a 14-day ban of all home and away contests as a spectator. And they also must complete the NFHS sportsmanship course prior to being allowed back at those events. A third instance would result in a ban for the remainder of the season 
that the occurrence did happen, plus the upcoming season. And then if applicable, it would also include a 25% code of conduct violation for violation four of conduct unbecoming. For a fourth instance, that's going to be a lifetime ban from all MGHS events. With that first violation, that is a state association requirement. And ultimately we're at that point with the current culture of high school sports and youth sports in general, it just can't be close. So it's not necessarily about whether or not someone thinks an ejection was warranted or whatever their thoughts may be around it. Once the ejection occurs, we're, we're in process there. Um, and there is a lot of latitude for game workers as well as officials to make that call as far as whether an ejection is warranted. Uh, and according to WI game management bylaws, there is no appeal process or really anything else at that point. Once the ejection happens, it has happened. Let's take a moment to talk about our registration requirements here at the high school. So looking at registration, one of the things that needs to happen, and is probably the most labor intensive thing because it requires scheduling, paperwork, and so forth, is a physical must be on file prior to any participation being allowed whatsoever. And physicals are valid for two school years. For this current school year, it must be on or after April 1st of 2023. So when it comes to physicals, there is essentially when, it, when we're looking at physicals, they are either good for the school year or they are not good for the school year. Physicals don't expire mid school year. And that's an important thing to recognize that you don't necessarily have two years from the date in which the physical was conducted. You have two school years based on where it falls on the calendar. So on or after April 1st, 2023 is when the physical paperwork or when the date of examination for that corresponding physical paperwork needs to be on file for it to be valid for this current school year. There also is a code agreement, concussion agreement, acknowledgement of risk, a WIA eligibility form, a registration form, as well as a player and parent guardian contract, which does kind of revolve around those spectator guidelines that we have and the positive environment that we want to keep at our high school sporting events. And there's also a student code quiz. You'll notice that on registration that there is a Google form code quiz. It's 10 questions. It is for our student athletes to take. Uh, in order to complete it, and they just need to complete that once per school year. Basically, it just is another route to help educate them on what our code guidelines are for participation. When it comes to finishing registration, what you're going to want to see, and the reason I'm addressing this is because we do all of our registration in Infinite Campus, and this is probably our most frequent question that comes up, is how do I know registration has been completed? One of the things you will need to do is you'll need to see in your cart on Infinite Campus that you have one item in cart, which is that sport registration, and you'll select My Cart. And this is one of the finishing touches there. And then from there, you'll have the ability to essentially type in your email address or the email address that the receipt should go to. It should be yours. And then once you have that receipt email address entered in, you'll select yes. And then it'll ask, do you want to submit payment for $0? And you would select yes. This is how you know you have finished registration. Because if you typed in your email address correctly in that previous step, you should receive a receipt in your email for $0 signifying completed on the parent side. The student will also need to log into their portal and sign the corresponding documents as well. But those are the final steps of registration and you should receive that receipt knowing that you have completed registration on the Infinite Campus side. You are always welcome to reach out to our office as well if you have any questions or want to verify that a student that you have successfully registered your athlete for the sport season. We also have very strict deadlines when it comes to having registration completed by in order to participate on that day one of practice. We are going to process a lot of different student registration in order to make sure our records are as up to date as possible and in order to get that communication to the coaches and as well as be able to ad accurately process the registration information, handle any situations that may come up, we need to have time in order to do that. So that registration needs to be completed by 4 p.m. on the following dates, depending on the sport that you're participating in, in order to be eligible to practice on that first day. So for instance, with girls basketball, gymnastics, boys and girls hockey, we need it on the Thursday before the season starts that following Monday. So we need it by 4 p.m. on Thursday, November 7th for those sports. For boys basketball, boys swim and dive, as well as boys and girls wrestling, you need to have that all registration completed by Thursday, November 14th in order to be eligible to participate on day one. 
There will be no participation on day one unless you have all of that information in. Registration is going to be open for almost a month. You need to get this done as soon as possible in order to make sure that you're eligible for that first day of practice and in order for us to be able to uh, make good decisions on whether student athletes are eligible or what their status is on a particular team. Uh, through our office. This is not something you should be showing up day one of practice to the coaches with any forms or just saying, well, the athletic office said I was good or whatever it may be. We will handle all of that communication and make sure our coaches have the proper information to start day one of practice. After that, it'll take one business day in order to participate after you've completed registration. So for instance, if you complete registration, you missed it, and you show up on uh, Monday, November 18th, the first day of boys basketball, and you complete it that particular day, the earliest we're gonna allow you to practice is that following Tuesday. So we have time to look at the registration, and we have time to make sure we make a proper eligibility uh, judgment same thing if you were to turn it in on that Wednesday, that first Wednesday of practice, the earliest you would practice is Thursday. So once you turn in registration and complete registration, your eligibility is not immediate. There is a waiting period for that in order for us to properly process that information. If you have any questions or as well as sign in to indicate your participation in this particular meeting, hit the QR code in the lower right hand corner of your screen or if you have, you're looking for clarification or if you have any feedback as far as opportunity where we should be emphasizing some information more or something that could use more clarification, please fill that out on that QR code there. Otherwise, I appreciate your attendance. I appreciate your commitment to our programs. And good luck this season, and go Team MG.